Maybe this one is on. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning, Zion. Good morning. Hey, we want to welcome you in. If you're here for the first time, we're really glad that you're here today. Uh, if you're here and this is still a new environment for you, we're just really glad that you're here. It's a new environment for us still. We've been doing this for, for a number of years. And so uh, what we found is when we come with hearts, not knowing what God's going to do, we tend to encounter him in ways we haven't before. And so welcome today. Uh, we're going to get started with worship. Uh, if you're coming here today and you, you need healing in your body, there are chairs on this side and this side of the center sanctuary. There's those white chairs by the exit doors. You can sit in that chair and then our team of uh, leaders will come around and they're just going to gently pray for you during worship. And we've just seen so many people uh, get breakthrough in those healing chairs. So go ahead and sit in those chairs if you need healing today in your body. Uh, there's also uh, earplugs by the nursing mother's room if their worship music is a little bit loud for you today. Um, but man, I don't know about you. I'm just really ready to step into a place in God today. I'm really, really ready to, to step into a place of worship with Jesus today. So why don't you guys join me if you would. Why don't you stand up and you're welcome to come on up front here. This is an area we just affectionately call the river. There's a picture in the book of Revelation of a river that flows from the throne of God. And you know, if you want to get out of your seats, just kind of get out of your comfort zone, you're just welcome to come on up and, and worship in the river today. Um, but if you're here, thank you for just standing up as we just prepare our hearts. If you're in conversation and just have an amazing Holy Spirit fellowship, we bless that. I just ask you to move it to, this, to the lobby so we can just begin to create a space in here for Holy Spirit that, that we could give him not a divided heart, but a whole heart. That we could give him not a divided attention, but all of our affection and our attention right now. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we worship you in this place, God. We worship you in spirit and in truth, Holy Spirit. And we welcome you just to come, just to flood our time together, God. To come and just flood our time together in your presence, God. That we're not here to sing songs, Lord. We're not here just to gather. We're here, Lord, for you. We're here because we love you, Jesus. We say Jesus is Lord. We set the Spirit as Lord in this house. And we say, Holy Spirit, come and flood this place. Holy Spirit, come right now and just begin to flood our senses, Lord. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We just welcome you, God. We just throw out the welcome mat for you, God. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to read some declarations of something I read about an apostolic environment, an apostolic culture. It says this. It says, we are sent and we send. We are empowered and we empower. We are relational and we are family. Just let these declarations just sink into you right now. We demonstrate power. Everything that happens originates in the unseen and we value the unseen. We say that God is faithful and so we persevere. We confront the impossible. We build on the foundations of others and we pursue and value encounters with Jesus. We represent Christ. We encourage and we are strengthened and we are redeemed and so we redeem. So Holy Spirit, we just welcome you. We thank you, God, for what you're doing today. We thank you right now, Lord, for just moving us from glory to glory, God, for bringing us into those new realms of your presence. Everyone in the room, let's just lift up our hands right now. Let's just raise our hands. It says in the Bible to lift up, O oh, you ancient gates, open up you doors, that the King of glory may come in, that the King of glory may come in, that the King of glory may come in. Just go ahead. Just be in the prayer right now. Let's just begin to do you just use your own words right now. Just love on the Lord. Just love on the Lord right now. Just enter in. Don't wait for the third song or the second song. Just right now. Lord, we just enter in, God. We just enter into you today, Jesus. Place. You're welcome in this place. 
Welcome in this place. Welcome in this place. You're welcome in this place. Welcome in this place. Welcome in this place. And that's the song of the redeemed Rising from the African plain The song, the song of forgiven, drowning out the Amazon rain. Oh, the song of Asian believers, filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a love song born of a grateful choir. It's all God's children. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Yeah. All God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. And all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. So let it rise above the four winds. Sound. Let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none ring truer than this. In all God's children sing.
Shout out, shout out, bless the Lord on my soul and let all that's within me shout out, shout out, bless the Lord on my soul and let all that's within me shout out, shout out, bless the Lord. Forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, saves my life from destruction. Yes, Lord. Oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. And all that forgive me, bless your name. Oh, bless the Lord.
is yours, Almighty Father. All the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. We bow down. We bow down. And all of the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. All of the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. All of the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. We lay down, we lay down. And all of the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. All of the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. And all of the glory and honor is yours. It's yours, Almighty Father, and all of the glory and honor. It's yours, Almighty Father. We lay down, lay it down. And all of the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. And all of the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. And all of the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. and uh, he's got a word. He just saw a vision. I just want him to release it over you right now. So just stay in this atmosphere. So I saw the, the ground. Um, and it was like a, a, a hard crusted layer. Um, it was very dry. And as God was walking through, that crust was being broken. 
and underneath the crust was this very rich soil. And up through the soil was shooting these, um, these new fruits, um, these, these little seedlings. And it's the things that we thought were dead, um, the things of our past that we, we considered impossible over time. Um, they're, they're shooting up, they're, they're coming back to life. Um, and he said, it's no mistake that today looks like a rainy spring day. Um, it's, it's coming to life. So those things that were impossible, those things we thought were dead, they're coming back and they're being watered and life is coming back to it. So he's crushing the earth. He's crushing the dry places. He's crushing the soil. That's what he's doing. He's crushing it. So keep your eyes on him. Keep praising him. He's crushing it. wants to do too is is re remind you of the testimonies that he's done and use that as a base for what he's going to do so um, what I want to do today is is bring up one specific memory from this year that has happened one testimony of his goodness and hold it in your your hand hold it out and just meditate on that goodness and then think of what that goodness looks like tripled, 
what does that look like? What does that situation look like when there's better, when there's more poured out? He wants to do a, kind of an exchange. He wants you to take what he's given you and he wants you to hold it out and put it down and then hold out both hands because the better is coming. 2020 is better. He's getting better. Everything is getting better. So just think of that goodness and triple it. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you, God, for the better. We thank you that this is, this is forever. The better is forever. It's going to constantly be getting better. So we open our hands and we say, pour it out, God. Our expectations are high. We're looking for you to move. We're looking for you in every moment to move, God. So lay down the old and hold out your hands for the new. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Jesus. All right. Now, you have to share the goodness. So as we close out here, as you remember that moment and you're dreaming for more, on your way back to your seat, share the testimony of what you're expecting. Share that triple number with, with your neighbor as you walk by. Help them dream bigger. Celebrate their testimonies. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning. Everybody good? It's good to see your faces. I just have a couple of announcements before we do offering. And that is on January 12th at 8 a.m., 8 to 9 a.m., before service, Normandy Project is sponsoring a pancake breakfast. And so I want Tori, Tori, will you stand up? Where are you? See this little girl right here waving how cute she is? This is her idea because she has got such a heart for these girls coming off the street, and she's doing this, her and her dad, it sounds like. <laughs> so can we just give it up for Tori? Come on. That's awesome. There will also be gluten-free pancakes, in case you're wondering. Uh, so bring cash or check for that, $5 for regular pancakes, $7 for gluten-free, I think that's right, and I believe they're going to have some meat, too. All right, that's good news, right? Pancakes, everybody loves pancakes. Okay, uh, second thing is uh, New Year's Eve communion and blessing is coming. That's going to be from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., and then at 9 to midnight, we're going to have some praise, worship, and intercession. We've never done that before. I know some of you guys already have plans for New Year's Eve, but we would love to have you here ringing in the new year with us if you don't. All right? Are you ready to do offering? Yep. On the slide behind me is going to be ways to give. You can text. You can go on the Zion app. If you are viewing us online right now and you couldn't get to church today, you can still give. That's good news. You can go to the website, zionequip.com, and give there. Or you can go to your app on your phone right now and give. If you are uh, wanting to give by the end of the year and you want to send something in, it needs to be postmarked by the 31st of December for you to get credit and for us to meet all of our needs, <laughs> right? Okay, you guys are so quiet today. I feel like I need to over talk or something. Are you ready to declare some awesome stuff over your finances? <laughs> Me too, why don't you stand up? Because we can like really get it from the diaphragm then. So when we say this, uh, if there's, if there's one, one or two things that really stick out to you that you're really believing for, we like to just shout it a little bit louder. So if you're visiting, sometimes people, you'll hear people just shout some certain lines a little bit louder than others because they're really putting their faith behind it. So if you want to do that, you can do that too, okay? Ready? As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for... Glory. 
explosions in my workplace. All right, give it up for Jesus. Actually, you know what, keep, your, keep on your feet for one second. We have a special speaker today. Jim is in Pickerington, so I'm holding down the fort here with, you got it, Sean O'Rourke. Can you give it up with him? Thanks, Thanks Hey, hey. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Coming through? Okay, so uh, welcome. Uh, I want to give a brief update on the Normandy Project. So th there's information in the lobby. You can learn more about it uh, if it's new for you. Um, but a lot of us have really kind of played a role in helping us buy a building in downtown Columbus on Broad Street that we own. And right now we're working with all the moving parts to begin to get it renovated. And there's all sorts of city permitting and zoning and uh, everything's going really well, but I want to give you guys a 2019 snapshot. So this building is going to be used to house women who are coming out of human trafficking situations. And so our journey right now is to get the building prepared for that, for that purpose. That makes sense, everyone? Okay, so here are a couple snapshots for the year. I know it's a little bit small. It's hard to do a lot of information, but you guys on the front row can tell everyone else, tell your friends afterwards. Okay, so the first thing, I just want to kind of highlight a couple things. One, we've had 208 individual donations this year to the Normandy Project, so thank you, Jesus. It's so awesome. This year, we've received $53,452.47 in new donations to the Normandy Project. This is, this is like pretty awesome stuff, guys. Uh, right now, our current cash on hand is just below $75,000 for the Normandy project. The abatement, so this is the cost of toxicity abatement. Abatement. It's like getting rid of all the toxins, all the asbestos in the building. The building is well over 100 years old. It's basically from the dawn of creation. They don't even know when the building was made uh, because it's been through so many, um, so many changes over the years. That's $100,000. So that means we, we're looking to raise another $25,000 uh, in, in, as soon as we can uh, so that in February, we can really begin to start that process of abatement. Does that make sense? So I just want to give you guys a brief snapshot. We're doing really, really well. Uh, a couple highlights. There's no way you can read those. But uh, all M MPE floor de uh, planning designs, so those are mechanical, plumbing, and uh, electrical designs, are completed and approved. We have preliminary approval from the downtown dis uh, district uh, committee or commission uh, for our renovations. These, might, these things sound like one line item that took us months to be able to do. Does that make sense? Uh, we're set for our applications for city permitting. Uh, we've had weekly prayer gatherings and worship within the building. If you haven't been to the building, uh, we've brought teams in that are praying there on a regular basis. Uh, that big window room that we're going to create, uh, that kind of worship environment. and It's a huge space. Basically, our intercessors and people have gone down there and are just constantly praying over the building and over every room in the building. And they're writing scriptures on the wall. You know, it looks like Jesus is squatting in our building. And, and so if you go in, I mean, it's torn apart, but there's scriptures everywhere. You know, I give tours to politicians. You know, it's, 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 an, it's an interesting dynamic. Okay. Uh, uh, we have built really strong relationships with political, civil, and business leaders, uh, everyone from state government, local government, um, even uh, uh, federal government from Washington, D.C. A senator has reached out to us wanting to really get behind what we're doing. So these are just some yay God things. You guys can, you know, kind of yay God if you want to. Uh, now, this is awesome. We just negotiated and signed a new five-year lease for our bra the, the bagel shop on the first floor. Thank you, Jesus. So now... That is good for 2024, and there's a five-year option on top of that. So essentially, we have about a 10-year lease in place uh, with, that new, with that tenant uh, for uh, cash flow into the building. Uh, and we have had zero additional debt in 2019 on the building. So yay, Jesus. So you can still give to that as well. There's a, there's a black box in the lobby that you can always put offerings in. You can write checks to the Normandy Project and mail them here or give on our app or any of those ways to select the Normandy Project if you feel led and want to help us kind of bridge that gap of that $25,000 window uh, that we're looking to close. So 
Guys, thank you so much for everyone who's donated and given towards it. We just want to let you know so many things are going on behind the scenes. We cannot wait to begin to roll into our renovation phases and uh, continue to give you guys really great updates as you guys are really passionate about seeing this city change. And, you know, one of the things, the, the thing that was really leading this whole this whole project, the Normandy project, it really started from a vision. It started, I mean, literally from a dream, not like a goal, not like a goal dream, like a dream dream and a vision. And uh, it really started from a place of God encountering our city. And it, then he began to unpack it more if he wants it to look like this with human trafficking effort. He wants it to look like this. And, and so we are just taking one step at a time in faith. And, and each time we step each time we take a step, God continues to show up with the right conversation or the right donation that came in at that, at that last minute. How many of you guys have seen God maybe show up at the 11th hour of your own life at times? You know, sometimes it's like we want God to be there at like, you know, at 1 p.m. and he shows up at like 11.59. But you know what? That part of that is just this journey of trust that we go on with him personally. And so thank you guys for partnering with us too for the Normandy Project. So... Well, we're going to do something a little bit different. You guys okay if we do something a little bit different this morning? Yeah. Pastor Jim's not here, so he can clean up the mess next week. Uh, but he'll be back next week, like Mary said. Um, but we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we want to really, it's been on our hearts for a number of weeks now, to take some time and just begin to um, uh, celebrate some testimonies of the Lord. I don't know about you, but testimonies do something inside of me that kind of nothing else does. You know, when I hear a testimony, it's like something either comes alive inside of me or faith is ignited in a place or hope just goes to a different level or you begin to walk with an expectation of something. You know, it's one thing to sing God is good. It's another thing to see his manifest goodness on the earth. And both are really important. We declare it and we see it. We, we, we see it and then we declare it again. And it's this beautiful, beautiful relationship we have with God. And, you know, Psalm 119 is one of my favorite psalms. And it's super long. It's the biggest, you know, chapter in the Bible. And uh, over and over, if you read that psalm, it says over and over again, I will delight myself in the testimony of the Lord. That it's a practice, not just of reading the word, but actually of taking hold of the testimony of the Lord personally. So we, meaning this, there's an active listening part that we're responsible for as we, be, be, as we begin to become immersed in testimonies. Does that make sense? And so just turn your active listening part on right now. Whatever that looks like for you, that you're not just going to sit there and kind of, oh, Thank you, Jesus. You're good. There's something inside of you that's taking hold of what God is doing in the spirit. Does that make sense? So, okay, so first we have a couple guests we're going to invite up. So if I could have Stephen Bell. Stephen's awesome. He's over here. I think the mic, I think, is there a mic? Do I have the mic? Awesome. Thanks so much. So Stephen uh, and Jenny, where's Jenny? Jenny's over here. She's amazing. Stephen's wife. And so Stephen has uh, come on to our CSSM leadership team and is doing some really cool stuff uh, with CSSM Pal that starts in a couple weeks. Just join. Don't, look, don't wait for the announcement. Just join. Uh, and, but Stephen has been really helping us out there. But, you know, he's an amazing uh, man of God. He's an amazing, uh, really apostolic, prophetic kind of fire breather. Um, and so we, he just had something really cool happen that I'm going to let him share about. Awesome. Man, thanks. Breathing fire. I like that. That's a good word. Um, Man, I, it's just so good to be here with you guys this morning. We love Zion. We love Jim and Mary and Sean and the team. Man, it's just, we love this house. So we're, you know, it's, it's cool to share this testimony, but we're receiving from the abundance of this house as well this morning. So it's awesome. But yeah, I just want to share a, a quick testimony. I think it was a couple months ago. Um, and and the, the cool thing about this testimony is it was totally a God setup. Like we, we just kind of... Found we stumbled upon it, and God just kind of thrusted us into this this story. And and so it was uh, one evening. It was about midnight. Jenny and I were uh, laying in our bed. We were not asleep, but we were quickly heading in that direction. And uh, Jenny got a phone call, and it was uh, her uh, her best friend called and was like, "Hey." Um, there, there's a, this young man that we know, um, and Jenny, Jenny knew the family, but I didn't, but she's like, there's this young man, uh, in his home. He's don't get freaked out by this, but he's manifesting demons. It's taking four grown men to hold him down. He's 19 or 20 years old. 
um, just started going to college and we don't know what's going on, but can you guys be praying? And so, um, so she's like, oh my gosh, Jenny's talking to her. What's, what's going on? Jenny, I didn't know the family, but Jenny had met the mom before. And, and so she, I think Jenny hung up or something like that, or maybe, oh no, she called me, her friend called me, and then while I'm talking to Jenny's friend about it, um, the mom of the, of, the, of the young man who was basically possessed, <laughs> filled with demonic oppression, calls Jenny and says, hey, we've been praying and your husband's name came to our mind, can he come and pray? So I'm like, wow, deliverance at 12.30 at night. This is, this is gonna be awesome. And so I said, yeah, okay, I'll go. And uh, some friends came and picked me up. We go there. Long story short, um, I walk in. Now, I've, I've been in situations like this before. I've, I've had some experience with deliverance, primarily overseas, Africa, India. Like, it's just a given that you're gonna see it there. I've seen it a little bit in the States, but not like this. And so I walk in and I'm like, am I in Africa? Because this kid is like out of control. He's almost, he's this little, he's not a big kid. And he's almost stronger than these four grown men who are holding him down. Demons are speaking through him. I know that might seem a little freaky to some of you. It's, it's actually not that freaky. It's kind of fun. But anyway, demons are speaking through him. And I walk in and... The first thing that I, that I picked up on was there's too many people in the room. There's too many voices. You know, people are, in the name of Jesus, there was just, it was, it was a little bit chaotic. Um, but the people in the room loved him, and so they're praying. And I, I would say there was a measure of breakthrough that night, but I knew in my heart just because of, of what I've experienced in the past, I knew that he wasn't totally free. So there's a little measure of breakthrough. We leave, we're praising the Lord. The next morning it happens again, but it, it's even worse. He's getting even more violent. Um, and the people who were involved, they just didn't know how to handle it. So they called the squad and the police and they came and handcuffed this kid because they walk in. Can you imagine the police walking in? <laughs> I wasn't there, but they walk in on this young guy manifesting demons and they're like, I mean, literally they're thinking he's crazy. That's their only, the only thing that, that they can think. So they handcuff him and they take him to the psych ward. This is devastating for the family. Um, so I hear about it, I call the mom, I say, listen, um, I'll, I'll put together a small team, we'll come to your house, and I'll pray with your son if you would like me to. But I, I said, I, I wanna tell you, I'm gonna approach it completely different than last night. And, and she said, okay, um, assemble your team and I'll let you know when they release my son. So we go to the house. I prep the son a little bit, just kind of talking him through some things. And, and um, we sat down and I lay hands on him, not to command the demon out yet, but I just said, I'm welcoming the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden he jumps up and yells, no, and, and tries to choke me. Like he comes charging at me and I'm like, whoa, I mean, good thing I had some, you know, ninja-like reflexes. And so I'm 43, but I'm, I'm, I still, I'm quick, man. I can move. So, so I, I move out of the way and this other guy grabs him and we bring him to the ground. And, and one thing that I got to tell you on the way there is I, and I miss this, and this is an important piece, is as I'm praying on the way to their house, I said, Lord, I know I've, I've had a lot of experience with deliverance, but I'm not gonna rely upon that. I'm relying upon you. I wanna come into this moment as a novice. And so I'm saying, Holy Spirit, I'm listening to you. And, and so I came in, and, and so that happens, and on the way, the Lord spoke to me, and he gave me wisdom, and he said, don't address the demon, address the kid's name if he starts manifesting. So I was like, oh, I've never done that. So I did that, and I said his name. I said, I said his name, and then I said, come back to us. Said his name again, come back to us, and he snapped out of it just like that, starts crying, so he's back in his right mind, and, and from that point on, he did not manifest the rest of the time. 
because right when he came back, I said, you have a voice and you have authority. And it's like it, it shifted something in his mind. And from that point on, I bas- basically sozoed this kid and, and the Holy Spirit began to reveal lies that he was believing because my thought is, where's the open door? Where's the open door? We got to deal with that. We weren't dealing with that the night before. And so the Holy Spirit just starts revealing lies. We replaced it with the truth. He's repenting. And then it came out that he admitted and confessed that a while back he had actually opened up his heart to darkness and welcomed it in. And that's where it started. He said, that is the main open door. He repented, asked God to forgive him. And, and we just began to go after this kid's identity and speak value over him. He was dealing with suicidal thoughts and self-hatred. And so we just showered him with who he is in Christ. And he got totally set free that night, totally delivered the next morning. Yeah, come on. Jesus is good. And, uh, and so I, I texted the mom and said, hey, how's he doing? And, and she said he's, he's sleeping in. He's really tired, but he's doing great. And uh, I'm, I'm reaching out to him to try to get some coffee with him. But, man, God is good. So I, I guess if just to encourage you, like, um, it, it was easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, God made it simple, but it was simple because we listened to the voice of God. So God wants to, I just believe in 2020, we're going to see people delivered and set free. Amen. Amen. Come on. Wow. Yeah. See, why don't you just pray for us right now? Oh yeah, man. Something over us. Yeah. Yeah. Just put your hands out. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. You're amazing, Lord. Mm. Yeah. God, I thank you that, that even right now there's some people in the room that you've been dealing with anxiety, and, and I just hear the Lord saying, I am the Prince of Peace, and I'm coming in to your heart, to your mind, and, and just this exchange of, of just give the Lord your anxiety, and he's going to replace it with himself. He is the Prince of Peace. We take authority over anxiety right now in the name of Jesus. I set you free from that. And Father, we thank you. Um, Lord, I just thank you for the the grace of discernment on this house. The grace of discernment to not only discern where people need deliverance and freedom, but to discern what the Holy Spirit is doing and saying. So we thank you for that upgrade, for that increase of anointing and awareness and discernment in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on. You know, and I, I just want to ask this, like who here feels like that gift of discerning spirits is something that you've moved in or something that you know is on your life? Maybe you've done it in the past or, um, you know, maybe right now you're learning to grow in it. Is that you? Can you just raise your hand? Can you just stand up real quick? And what we're going to do right now is by standing up, you're just saying, I'm walking into that testimony, that I'm walking into that, that you don't need a, 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 a school you don't need uh, to go listen to 38 messages that right now that you have the message living inside of you, that you have the message living inside of you, the capital M message living inside of you. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you right now for these freedom bringers, God. Yes. We thank you, Jesus, that, that it's time to just step into that role, to step into that place. So Father, we just release over them boldness, God. Just boldness, Lord. We thank you for, for, for crystal clear clarity in the Spirit, that they carry crystal clear clarity. And right now, right now, we just thank you for that. We will not despise the day of small beginnings, God, that we will not despise those days, those little promptings, Lord, those little opportunities, Jesus. We thank you right now, Holy Spirit. And we just release over them. Yeah, just a fresh wind and a fresh grace and just a fresh fire to see people set free, to see Jesus get his reward, to see Jesus be high and lifted up through this gifting, through what you're doing in their life, God. So we just say that, that right now, that this, is going to be, that this city is going to be more free than it's ever been before, that people are going to encounter deliverance where they want to and don't know how to get to it, that you're going to bring it to them. So, Father, we thank you right now, Lord, for these freedom bringers, God, in yeah. Jesus' name. Yes, in Lord. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You anything else, Stephen? No, I'm good. Man. Amen. Come on. Do you need this? Or you yeah, need I need that one more time. Wow. Whew. Wow. Jesus. 
Don't you want to just set everyone free right now? Maybe it's just me. So we're going to uh, have another, someone else come up, Karen Anderson. We'd love to have you come on up, Karen. Karen is amazing. Karen has been one of our Sozo leaders for many years. Uh, she has a ministry um, really going pretty global now, uh, but a ministry that uh, is really catered locally towards women coming out of uh, different uh, incarceration situations, and she just really carries such a, an ability to kind of, um, how would you describe Karen, an ability to peacefully demolish situations. <laughs> this is the best way I can describe. So Karen, go ahead and share some share a testimony. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction. <laughs> okay, so I just recently returned from Brazil. I was invited to the first Brazilian Sozo Summit ever held, and I went to that, but I took pastors with me so that they could see what Sozo was about. In one church, I held over 25 Sozos. Understand, I was living in the pastor's home, and he kept seeing all these people go in and out different. <laughs> yeah, I had to make three trips to his city because they kept saying, come back, we need you to come back. And uh, one of the things that happened was that I met this young man named Ezekiel. He was raised in a Pentecostal church, but at a very young age, he decided God didn't exist. So he started trolling the internet to look for power, and he found it in the occult world. See, his leadership was preaching one thing, and living another way. So that's what made him feel like God did not exist, neither did Satan. So Ezekiel tried to put a spell on a girl he wanted to date, and he couldn't do it. So he called his superior, and he said, I have to have you to come put a spell on this girl because I want to date her. His terminology for himself was that he was a wizard. Okay? <laughs> he wouldn't call himself a Satanist because he said, I don't believe in Satan. Okay, so his superior comes, tries to put a spell on the girl. He said, I can't touch her. He said, why not? He told him, said, because she's protected by God. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome, but it destroyed his world. Okay? God didn't exist. Who is this God? He, he asked his superior. Well, you know, Jehovah God. But that's the one I don't believe in. So you know what? He tried to kill himself. And one of the young men that I had so zoed had a white aura around him. His suicide attempt did not succeed, praise God. Okay, so then this young man brought him to see me. And he said, you have a white aura, so I'll listen to you. I said, okay, never had been approached by an unsaved wizard before. But it was all right. So um, you can sozo someone who is unsaved, guys. Okay, I found that out. I learned a lot about the occult and how to approach it. And I said to Holy Spirit, what do I tell him? And Holy Spirit said, he's gifted just like you. So tell him that. So I looked at him and I started reading his mail. And he looked at me, he said, how do you know this about me? I said, because Holy Spirit is telling me this. He said, who's this Holy Spirit? I said, he's part of the Trinity. So I did some education, okay? I said, what you don't know is you're gifted like me, so this is what you're feeling. And I started going through the whole thing of what he was feeling. And I said, your problem is you've been listening to the wrong broadcasting signals. 
You've been listening to The Counterfeit, and I listen to the real. And God wants to bring you into the unique you that he made you to be. And do you know that young man started into the sozo first? He looked at me and he said, he had a great big Harry Potter symbol on a necklace. He said, uh, should I have this on? I said, you already know the question, the answer to the question, or you wouldn't have ever even asked it. He said, right, and off it came, okay? So I started sozoing an unsaved, unbelieving 19-year-old young man who had just tried to kill himself who had just had his whole world devastated. And he had an encounter like I've never seen before with Father God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. And he saw things he had never seen before. And he heard things, he heard them speak so clear because he's a seer. And a seer sees through five senses. Okay, he heard, he saw, he smelled, he tasted, and he felt. And he was so surprised. And he said, oh, I got to have this. This is real. So I led him to the Lord. The beauty of it is that that story was multiplied so many times while I was down there. And I got such a treasure uh, through Ezekiel. And uh, we had a youth rally. And they told me, you're going to pray over every young person in this building, which there was a lot. And I said, okay. So I started going around praying. It reminded me kind of of how we did it here, you know, and you just go down the line, then go around and down the line, and go around and down the line. That's what I did. And I got to Ezekiel, and the Holy Spirit said to him, it's time to use your gift. See, Ezekiel could speak English. I could not speak Portuguese. <laughs> but I, I just kept right on going. I turned around for the next line, and he was with a young woman and her boyfriend. And he was prophesying to them, okay? And uh, I had another young man with me that was interpreting for me. And I said, I want to know what Ezekiel's saying. So you go ahead and I'll pray over these people in the, in the tongue. God will take care of it. <laughs> and he, told, he came back, he said he prophesied over them. I said, what did he say? And he was telling me, those two young people got saved that night. Wow. We had five saved in that service. And we had many that were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And all of these were young people. And Cheryl, what time? I'm done. Okay. <laughs> all right, Sean, I'm done. God was good to me. <laughs> wow. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> you know, I had a, a pastor friend of mine <clears throat> told, this, told me this story about how uh, there was this, um, this young woman going to his church, and she was just the most kind of tea and toast looking Christian girl you'd ever seen. Just, just little thing and just really quiet and gentle. And uh, she was a student at CCAD, which is a Columbus School of uh, Columbus College of Art and Design here in Columbus. And so, uh, so he goes to her, she goes to him, the pastor, and says, You know what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm going to have a tea party for my friends that don't know Jesus. And now the pastor is familiar with CCAD. And so he's like, Who are you going to invite? And she's like, well, you know, this person, she began to go through different people. And these were all like, you know, let's just say like a lot of dark clothing was being worn by these individuals, like just really not into Jesus at all, have no grid for it, actually pretty, pretty mean towards Christians in general. Um, I'm sure you guys can think of maybe someone, maybe you were that person uh, before. And, 
So it's all these pretty radical kind of uh, personalities. And she's like, yeah, I'm just going to invite them over, and uh, we're going to have a tea party, and I'm going to tell them about Jesus. And being a pastor, he couldn't say that's a bad idea. <laughs> but he wanted to say that's a bad idea. And so she goes ahead, and, and he, he, he told his wife, um, he told his wife about the situation, and he's like, this is going to be terrible. Like, just get ready. We're going to have to pray for her because this is going to be bad. Just such a rich expression of faith. And, <laughs> and so she invites, she invites like pretty much like the most marginalized, really um, different kinds of people that you could like imagine that were on her campus that she personally knew. She invites them all over, and Holy Spirit just shows up at this tea party, and all of these guys get saved. Like all of them get, get saved and have encounters with Jesus. And I just love that story that, you know, with Karen just going just doing what God put on your heart to do, showing up, and all of a sudden, you know, she, she's ministering. I mean, she's giving you guys like the cliff notes. There's a lot more to that story and her journey um, just recently of just stepping into that space that only you can step into, stepping into your lane and not trying to step into somebody else's, you know, stepping into your lane and seeing how God can show up in your life and, th and through your life. Why don't you guys open up your Bibles? Uh, to Matthew, uh, let's go to Matthew 6.33. See how we're doing on time. Awesome. So I think we have it actually overhead. I don't have to flip open. But Matthew 6.33. We'll kind of get that one ready. Um, and this is a passage that we're probably pretty familiar with. Um, this is the NIV saying, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So this is Jesus. This is the middle of the most powerful message ever given, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is going through all the areas that um, people were giving their attention. What you wear, what you, where you'll go, what you eat, what you drink, the, the concerns of life. And, you know, Jesus said, rather than focus on those things, instead, seek first his kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God, his purposes, his person, his plans, who he is. And all of these other things will be given to you as well. You know, and, and I think that there's something powerful about us not being so familiar with that verse that we don't do it, thinking we've already done it. But actually, God, where do, where do I need to do that in my life? God, where does that apply to my life? You see, we don't have to give you, we don't, we don't have to rewrite the red words in the Bible. We just have to encounter the author in them. Does this make sense? And, and, and there's something really powerful, there's something really important about taking a moment. Maybe we, this is because it's the end of the year that God's really bringing this up and wants us to kind of launch into our next season uh, through the right the right lens and on the right foundation is just taking a moment to recognize God are there places in my life that I have been giving my heart my attention that I have been giving my focus that I've been giving my thoughts my affections above you you know first John says that if you love the world the love of the father can't be in you and I've always read that and I'm like does that mean I have to like hate the world you know what I mean does that mean that like what does that look like? You know, that there, we hold scripture in tension. That if you love the world, the love of the Father can't be in you. So does that mean like, like how can you do that? Has anyone else thought this before? Like how can you do that? Because we're in the world and we're called to love the world, but not love the world. We're called to love people, but not be in love with the ways of the world. See, the ways of the world want to get our attention on temporal things. You know, biblically, spiritually speaking, the context is this, is that there is, there's a prince of this world, according to the Bible, that roams around trying to do some things to, one, mess up believers and mess up people. So the devil wants you focused on you. The devil wants you focused on temporal things, on things like, how is that bill going to get paid? Things that, like, you know, if you're with Jesus, you're like, Jesus, I think that's pretty important. And Jesus is like, you know what? If you actually just focus on me, all those things will be given to you. They'll be added to you. It means that you're not even going to have to, 
What will come to you through grace, others will try through effort. Now, sometimes we, we, we carry that promise, like we carry that verse, that promise with us, but we're really just putting our attention over here. Does this make sense? So we know it, but we're not walking in it. Does that make sense? So can I, here, here are some things that, that are temporal things that are competing for our affections and our attentions. And we're going to go somewhere amazing with this. Just follow me for a moment. How about just your imperfect circumstances? You see, the ways of this world, the devil wants you to be so aware of your problems that it actually feels really responsible for you to seek a solution for them. Does that make sense? That I'm so aware of this that it must be the right thing for me to do is now seek a solution for this. Does this make sense? That, that it feels incredibly responsible and almost right to do. And what is the cost of that? The cost of it is not having God bring the solution that is going to be like an eternal, like a transformational solution, not a temporal one that is driven by a temporary circumstance through a temporary lens. See, the devil wants us to see those little things that are imperfect in your circumstances, your situations, and now be driven to a place of action, not driven to a place of faith. Does this make sense? You know, if you, if you stare at a problem long enough, faith just doesn't rise up, right? Like, if you just keep staring at a problem, the longer you stare at it, faith is not going to rise up. That it's actually, it's, it's when we lock eyes with Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, that faith shows up, that the solution comes. And so that the ability for the devil to get our eyes on temporal things, on distractions, are you guys with me? On these small little places actually send our life way off course, although it doesn't feel like it's way off course. It feels like, no, I have the verse and I'm just trying to solve something here. Right? I mean, is it just me? I mean, you, you have, but I'm just trying to solve something. It's good. Like, no, God's, like, God's in this. Did he tell you to do that? Well, no, I mean, it's implied. <laughs> right? How many of you do that? Like, like, an implied obedience is disobedience. Now, if you're, if you're like me, you're thinking, well, how in the world? Like, this is an impossible. This is, it's impossible to serve the Lord then. No, it's not. It just requires all of your heart. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. It requires intimate trust. It's a, I am dependent on Jesus to show up. So now to many of us in the room, you know, we're in the wealthiest part of the world and the wealthiest time of the world. It's hard for us to grasp that God actually would want that for our lives. He actually wants us to be so dependent on him that if he doesn't show up, like we're dead. Like, we're in trouble. The situation won't get solved. That's what it looks. So the Christian life is only lived through intimacy with Jesus. Does this make sense? So let me give you a few more examples. Some of those solutions, we're trying to find a solution to a problem that isn't wrong in itself, but when our eyes are not locked in to seeking first him, his kingdom, Jesus says that that's actually not how my kingdom works. My kingdom works through your heart and your eyes locked on me. You know, the greatest thing that we have to steward as Christians is our relationship with Jesus. Now, biblical stewardship isn't just maintaining something. It's actually bringing it to increase. That it's, it's actually our personal relationship with Jesus that doesn't seem to solve the problem of the bill that needs to get paid, but somehow it happens. It's the most supernatural lifestyle you can live, is that the things of this world actually get solved through you laying down your life, through you locking eyes, through you going into your prayer closet, through you seeking Jesus. How many of you tried to solve problems on your own? And how many of you, it was, terrible, it was, a, it was a terrible journey? Anytime I try to solve a problem, it's like, oh, no, it's awesome. I, like, wrap it up. It's like, no, look, the problem's solved. And then, like, three minutes later, it just crumbles and deteriorates. 
that when it's not birthed out of that unseen realm, that the kingdom can't grow in that place. It'll just be me and a reflection of me growing in that place. You can apply this to your worship. You can apply this to your relationships in life, to your worries, your anx- those anxieties, those little foxes that try to come in. Are you guys still, are you guys still okay? So this is what happens is those solutions that the world offers, they start to become our little saviors in life. I can't, how can I pay this bill? It's something I didn't foresee. I, I didn't know this was coming. And, you know, maybe you're just, you're over your finances, but all of a sudden, you, who, who, who here had an unexpected bill in their life? Yeah? Okay. Then this is for us. This is for you. That bill comes. What do I do? You know, how many of you found you can't just cram Holy Spirit for a moment? <laughs> right? You can't just cram relationship. You're either developing it you're expanding it, you're growing your relationship with Jesus, and then those moments come, and they don't tear you down. They're going to point you to Jesus pretty fast, though, right? But they don't tear you down. You don't backpedal. You don't crumble. So the bill comes. What happens? Those little saviors want to come and and present themselves. Maybe, Maybe a savior becomes a credit card. Maybe you don't feel good. Maybe your health, you're going through some health issues. Maybe your savior becomes your medical insurance. It becomes, oh no, like I'm just going to run over here. Maybe living with a constant state of anxiety, worry, you begin to escape it through food, through drugs, through hobbies. Anything to take your mind off of it, it becomes your little savior. You know, Isaiah 45 is really, really clear. The people of Israel were were going through things like this, where they were constantly looking for a Savior outside of the Lord. And if we could put that verse overhead, Isaiah 45, it says this. It says, I am the Lord, there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. And then he says, and I'll strengthen you, even though you might not even be looking to me at the moment for it. Like, he's just so good that even in the midst of even... The problem comes, and this little, this little savior says, I will help. I'm just terrible. <laughs> I don't know how else to do it. It's in, it's in that little moment that God declares this over us, that I am the Lord, there is no other, that I am strong and mighty, that I am a strong tower in that situation. Not this little escape of a little savior. That there is no other. And as Christians, we tend to let this Western world get commingled in our DNA sometimes. And I believe right now that like this is the day to separate again, to separate from that stuff in our hearts, to separate from that stuff in our lives, to separate from that train of thought, to break agreement with that train of thought. And some of us, it's gonna feel really vulnerable. It's gonna feel like this. My little savior makes me feel good. And, and if I'm saying no to that, I'm going to feel unsure. It's in this place, this is what we would call dependency on Jesus. And he always shows up. He always shows up. Maybe it's not at 1 p.m. I love the 1 p.m. Jesus. But by 11.59, he will show up. Because he is faithful. You know, one of the ways that we're able to develop that relationship with Jesus, what would it look like for you? Let me just say this. What would it look like for you to push away those distractions, to bury those little saviors, and to come back to that place where you feel vulnerable, you probably feel insecure, you kind of those things that you may lean on aren't there, so you're just like, oh, like... How do I do this right now? What would it look like for you to press everything else aside and just come to steward your relationship with Jesus? Do you think that there are benefits of your covenant with God that you're not fully walking in because of those little saviors? Because they come in the place of him being provider? See, we declare, God, you're provider. But I'm going to, oh, sorry, the mic's on this side. (laughs) 
but I'm going to use a credit card right now. Don't hear me casting condemnation. I want to bring freedom from those little saviors. God, you are my healer, but I'm really not going to seek you for healing because I've heard that message before and it didn't work once. Am I speaking to anyone else in this room? That it's in those little pivots that we make that we become, we begin to, to, to stray from the course of God that God has for our lives. That the kingdom actually crashes in when all we have is Jesus. That blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. When all we have is Jesus, the world would not understand it, wouldn't agree with it, would say, oh my gosh, no, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this. Don't look for agreement from the world. You're a Christian. Like, you're otherworldly. Do you know that? Like, you're not made for this world. Now, I want to bring you guys through this really, the first, the first timeline. Now, this is a really simple timeline of just how to go from A to B in the kingdom. And, you know, I'm sure you guys can totally relate to this. And just, you know, what it looks like to... Uh, you know, everything from the fall to the, the Egyptian uh, bondage, Tower of Babel, the Christ. Are, are, you guys, are you guys just encountering Jesus right now? No. This is crazy complicated. You know, I'm a pastor, and I have to study each of these parts. This is like a picture of, like, of, of history and the timeline of the kingdom of God and when it comes crashing in. Now, here's the one that we can actually look at is this. Thank you, Jesus, for simplicity. Your entire life, if this was 40,000 years on a time frame, this little dot is your birth to death on earth. Your eternity is way before. Your eternity is way after. What we do now is this little blip in eternity that we, we don't have to live in faith when we're in heaven as a follower of Jesus. You know that? You're just going to be with Jesus, like we're with each other. I'm not with Wesley right now by faith. We're actually in the room, right? What I'm trying to say is this. This little dot is where the Lord says, if you will trust me with this little dot, I will give you all of this, that you'll walk in all of this. If you trust me and make yourself vulnerable to be dependent on me in this, for this little dot, you're going to see how worth it it was, even though temporarily you might feel uncomfortable. Temporarily, it might not feel like heaven on earth, but it actually is the seeds of heaven invading your circumstances. It's coming to that place of this little dot living a life of dependency on Jesus. You know, when I was... When I was... uh, I'm from Philadelphia, as a lot of you guys know, and I came to Columbus... uh, uh, like 19 years ago, and uh, I went to school here, and I've lived here obviously ever since. Um, and when in about 2005, um, me and a, a group of, of believers, a, a group of people, we just really like, like we just really love Jesus, right? We were all. My life got really changed. I surrendered my life. How many of you found there's a difference between saying yes to Jesus and surrendering to Jesus? Saying yes to Jesus, like the Prince of Peace comes and just fills your life. Saying, I surrender to you, Jesus, the Lion of Judah comes and rearranges your life. You know? They're both Jesus. It's both good. And I, I was in this place where just fully, just so happy to surrender to Jesus. And all I had was Heidi Baker teachings and my Bible. And that's literally all the church that I knew. That's all that I had. And so I would like come home from work. And, I, and if you're in CSSM, you've heard me tell this story recently. I would just come home from work. I was working in financial services. And I would just read through my Bible. I just couldn't get enough of it. And I would go to like different like coffee shops. And I would just read my Bible and write it out. I just, I wanted more than to read it. Like I want, like I, I didn't know how to like get this like in me. You know what I mean? And so like I didn't know, I wasn't in training. I wasn't in school or anything. So I, I would just write it. And by writing it, I felt like I was engaging with, with him more. And so I would just write Romans and read all of Romans and everything the Bible had to offer. And, and I just loved it. And, and, uh, and, and at, during that time, you know, I was living with a, a group of guys that were just these crazy partiers, totally in the world. And, and, I, and, and we were friends before, you know, I really surrendered my life to Jesus. 
so they're like, Sean, what is the matter with you? You know, you're just like, I don't even know what you're saying in your room, by the way, you know, because <laughs> I have my door closed and Heidi Baker's like, Haro Shababa, you know, like all this crazy stuff. I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know what it is, but I'm encountering Jesus. Like, and I would like share with them and all this stuff and, and they'd go out and, 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 and I would make them food when they came home from being out all night and, and they'd be like, what are you doing? You know, like, what's the matter with you? I'm like, nothing, man. I, you know, man, Jesus is just so good. Like, dude, are you hungry? You know? And during, during this season of my life, I'm just painting a picture of kind of where I was at, this season of my life, I would go out late at night and, and I would minister. I would go out and walk to Gallery Hop. And after everyone went home from Gallery Hop, this was like, this was like a long time ago. Like, so Gallery Hop wasn't quite what it is now, which is a downtown like Friday or Saturday, one of those nights, Saturday night in downtown Columbus. And, and I'd go out when everyone else went home. So I'd go out at like 11 p.m. And I would give food to like, around that time when everyone else leaves, um, there's a lot of like, all that's left are like the drug addicts and the homeless. And so I would go out and I would pack all these bags of food and go out and give them food and drink and, and lead them to Jesus sometimes or just pray for others. And they'd be in the stoops and just kind of foaming at the mouth and just come around them and get a chance to minister to them. Because all I had was Heidi Baker. I just thought this is what Christians do. I mean, I, that's like, that's all I had my context for. And so, so during the season of my life, you know, I didn't know what was going on. But looking back on it, I'm just so glad that God allowed me to be awkward and weird. And, and you know what? Like, like, I wasn't comfortable at all. I didn't know what was going to happen, like, from a day to day. I felt like I, felt like I just wasn't, like, enough or adding up for, like, the Christian who, like, knew their Bible really well. Can I, am I relating to anyone else in the room? And I'm just like, that's, where I, that's just where I was, you know? I used to actually think pastors had, like, a secret handbook, and I'm totally serious. I, for real, I'm like, how do they do that? I used to think, like, pastors, I'm like, you guys are just, like, awesome, like, how do you do all that stuff? Like, know what to say and, like, say it and, like, do all this stuff. I literally thought there was, like, a secret handbook that pastors had that they gave to one another. I'm totally serious. Obviously, it is the Bible, but I thought there was something else. <laughs> so around this time, a, a friend of mine, uh, Allison, started a prayer house at OSU. It's called the OSU Prayer House. Just very creative. Uh, and, and what it was was uh, an apartment on 10th Avenue that was rented out um, that it was a two bedroom apartment that was rented out and it was just for prayer. No one lived there. Does this make sense? And uh, we would actually, a group of us with Allison kind of like started this, this thing and this team. And uh, we were, uh, we called, we, we were called gatekeepers because we had like a key. So we would open it up and we got it to a place that it was like 24 seven, that there was always someone there to open it up and to be able to pray. And so we would just spend, like, me and a, a group of people, I mean, at that time, we would just spend, like, literally, like, hours and days in this house. Just one bedroom was kind of bigger, so it was for, like, worship and more of, like, a, a prayer kind of environment with your people. And then we had another room called the boiler room. And the boiler room was a smaller bedroom, and we had, like, signs on the door, like, stop, you're about to encounter Jesus, so, like, you know, get ready kind of thing. And, and we just had such a, an amazing time in the boiler room. And you go in the boiler room, and I'm just telling you, like, you would fall on the ground if you're there for more than two or three minutes, whether you know Jesus or not. Because it was just a consecrated, concentrated place of prayer, of intimacy with God. And I know we're in New Testament, we're not Old Testament. God lives in us, not geographically, I get that. But there's something powerful about, about little wells that you're digging and the glory of God just kind of showing up more and more. And so we'd be in there, and it was non-denominational. So there were, there were people from all churches and a lot of young adults that we would come, and, and we would just be praying and praying. And we weren't doing it for, there, social media like wasn't a thing back then. You know, and, and so like, like no one, like it wasn't for like take selfies in the prayer room, like Jesus is awesome. Like I'm into like some fun, I'm totally into fun stuff, but it wasn't for that. And to be totally honest, I don't know that everything in the kingdom is meant for public consumption. I, I just don't know that everything in the kingdom is meant to just be selfied out and just be kind of given away. You, you, like don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm talking about the, the, not everything is meant to be a marketing tool. Not everything is meant to have this really strong agenda in order to do something. And so at the time, you know, people from all different churches, we, we would just pray. We would just go there, and we would just pray all day, all night, all the time. Like, it was, looking back on it, it was, it, was, it was something that was really unique because almost all of us who were on that team at the time, none of us had ambition for, like, ministry or anything like that. We just loved Jesus. Current day right now, 
Uh, I know there are at least three senior pastors who are now senior pastors from our little team. Everyone on our team is now in full-time ministry. None of us had the goal. You know, I went on to lead prayer at, 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 at another church and do their intercession the way Claire does it here. Um, I would do it at, at this other church for a number of years. And, and it just began to be, be this platform, this foundation of what it looks like to actually like know Jesus just to know him. Am I making sense, you guys? Are you guys still with me? You know, wh- why am I bringing this up? Because when I was praying, even this week, I felt like the Lord said that his prayer closets are empty. That I just felt like the Lord just put it in my heart that, that there are prayer closets right now that are just empty. That, that it's one thing to go to church. It's one thing to like be part of stuff like this. It's another thing to actually go home and whether it's a physical closet or physical room, it's not, that's not the intent here. It's just that, that place of prayer is empty. And I feel like we just have an invitation to push those distracting thoughts, those little saviors aside, and to re-engage with expanding our relationship with Jesus. Now, there's a difference between praying and saying prayers. Some of you found that to be the case. Saying prayers, you're like, I don't even know if I believe these prayers. You know, praying is engaging with God. And so if we can go to the next slide, we're going to go through this real briefly. That There's a difference between praying and saying prayers. One is built on relationship, and one is built on solutions. One is finding their safe place of peace in the midst of your uncertainty, and one is just visiting and ready to exit as soon as the solution comes. One is getting lost in God's presence and who Jesus is. How many of you have gotten lost in God's presence and you go into that place and you forget what you even were praying for, right? Like, it looks like, it it might look like that. And the other is hoping to finish soon. That God, it's like 1.30, I could really use you to just show up at 1.35. One is laying their heart bare while one is walled up fearing vulnerability, that Jesus actually says, cast all of your anxieties on me. Not pray good prayers. You know, the, the best prayer times that I've had with the Lord, and just I'm just going to keep that language, you know, but just that, that prayer time, that place in God, is when I don't know what I'm saying, but that my, I'm, I feel built up inside, and I need to talk to Jesus about it. You know, there, whether it's an external circumstance, an internal circumstance, it's not really flow. They would never write a book of my prayers during that time. Is anyone, else, or is anyone else okay to just be a mess before Jesus sometimes? And it's amazing. You're a mess before Jesus, and he's like, you're a mighty prayer warrior. You're like, what? Like, how is that? That's such a great deal. I just, that's, a, that's, one is falling in love with Jesus because you're, you're finding that he fully loves you. And one doesn't want to surrender control and is often scared feeling distant. That I feel distant, and I don't want to surrender control. I don't want to open myself up to be vulnerable to the Lord. Instead, I'm just going to pray what I think are the right prayers. Does this make sense? You know, a friend of mine says, you should go on a, you should go on a three-hour uh, like, like a prayer walk at once a month. And some of us are like, no, thank you. I'll do that small chunks daily. And I asked him, like, why? And he goes, because after about 45 minutes, you'll run out of things to pray, and you'll actually start praying with the Spirit. Like, you'll run out of things to pray here, and now you're forced to actually pray with the Spirit. And when you go into that place of prayer, you know, God will use you to pray for things that you're like, I don't even know why I'm praying for about this place. I don't even know why I'm praying for this. I have no connection to that business or that person or that, or that nation or that city, but it's on my heart, so I'm going to begin to pray. It's in that place that God is actually releasing the kingdom of God through you. Because you're seeking first his kingdom. Are you guys still okay? Let me cut some things. You know, squashing those little saviors, saying no to those little things is going to feel vulnerable. And it's, you can't do it 
unless you're living that life, that you're, unless you're engaging with Jesus by pressing out those other things and coming to his feet, to, to living a life, waking up in the morning, in the evening, whenever it is, those moments of your day where you just have to press pause on the situation and reconnect and recalibrate with Jesus. Maybe you're, maybe you're a mom, maybe you're a single mom, and you got like three kids running around the house, and you're like, I don't relate to any of that. Here's the thing. Jesus can meet you in your circumstances. Jesus can meet you as the busy third shift worker, as the doctor. He can meet you as the student. He can meet you that feels like, I don't know what I'm doing and everything in my life feels messed up. He can meet us in our uncertainty if we just turn our affections and our heart towards him. And if we begin to develop, if I could bring that back up, if we can begin to develop a life of what it looks like to actually learn how to pray. And so in the early days of that prayer house, you know what we would say? People would come, and they were like, I don't know what to pray, and like, because we would be like, I don't know what to pray. You know? And, and, and everyone was like, what, what do we pray? You know? and, and this is what we learned. We just learned that we, we learned to pray by praying. Like, I learned to pray by praying. I, I, I enlarged in my secret place just by going there. I move into that space of intimacy with him as I just yield, surrender, trust to him. And all of a sudden, it's like, you know, Bill Johnson says this, if you go into your prayer closet, to your secret place, and you come out the same, you never actually went in. That it doesn't take an hour, it doesn't, although maybe it does, but it might not take two days, although maybe it does. In a moment, he can do something as we're going towards him with that heart of a father and their son, with that heart of, I'm coming to you for dependency. Are you guys still okay? I'll close with this. Song of Songs 2, I'll read verses 13 and 14. So verses 13 and 14, Song of Songs 2, verses 13 and 14. I'll read it. We might not come up overhead. This is out of the Passion Translation. These are promises in, in Song of Songs about what it looks like. It's an allegory of Jesus and the bride, of Jesus and the church, of, of the lost and their Savior, and their, their, their intimate relationship that God has, and his, his affections for the lost, his affections for his bride to come into union with him. It says this, it says, can you not discern this new day of destiny breaking forth around you? The early signs of my purposes and plans are bursting forth. The budding vines of new life are now blooming everywhere. The fragrance of their flowers whispers, there is change in the air. Arise, my love, my beautiful companion, and run with me to the higher place. For now is the time to arise and come away with me. For you are my dove hidden in the split open rock It was I who took you and hid you up on high in the secret place, the stairway in the sky. Let me see your radiant face and hear your sweet voice. Now, this is the shepherd king, Jesus, speaking to his bride. How beautiful your eyes of worship and how lovely your voice in prayer. Then it says this in verse 15. It says, now... You must catch the troubling foxes, those sly little foxes that hinder our relationship. For they raid our budding vineyard of of love to ruin what I've planted within you. Will you catch them and remove them for me? We will do it together. You know, in Revelation, Jesus wrote letters to churches. Jesus wrote these letters to the bride. And in those letters, you know what he said? He said to his bride, here are the things that I want you to pursue. I want you to pursue love. I want you to pursue intimacy with me at cost, truth, holiness, sincerity, mission, wholeheartedness. That out of that place of love, he can give us some direction. He can help us identify those little foxes that feel like they're not a big deal, but you don't know how much they're hindering your relationship with him. So what I want to do is this. If I could have our worship, worship team come up. If, if you're here this morning and you're just, you want to get rid of the foxes, if you want to say yes to Jesus, 
I want to just give you an opportunity to stand up. If you're like, hey, I'm, I'm hearing this, you know, and I, don't, I can't say that I have a relationship with Jesus, that I know that, that I am saved from my own sin, that he went to the cross for you and as you to take your place. He went to the cross so that you can live a life of relationship with God. And if you're here today and you're like, I've never surrendered my life to Jesus and to know him as my big savior, if you're here today and you want Jesus to be your savior, would you just stand right now? You're saying, this is my day. I'm not gonna leave this place without saying yes to Jesus. We're just gonna take a moment right now and if your heart's beating fast or if you feel like, well, maybe I've done that before, but maybe I need to re-up with Jesus today right now, I'm just gonna invite you to stand. We're just gonna take a moment and celebrate what God is doing. So if that's you, just go ahead and stand up right now. You're like, I wanna say yes to Jesus. I'm tired of living life bowing down to little saviors. I want to say yes to Jesus. I see you. Amen. Anyone else who wants to stand up and say, I'm not going to leave this place right now without taking God up on that, that, that offer of forgiveness of sin, of eternal life, to live a lifestyle of peace in the midst of uncertainty. If there's anyone else, just go ahead and stand. Now those standing and if you're not standing but want to just go ahead as I as I say this so those of you who want to connect with Jesus right now I want you to just close your eyes and I want you to just picture that door over your heart right now and I want you to see that door and I want you to swing it wide and right now in your own words just invite Jesus say Jesus come in Jesus have all of me. Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. Jesus, I receive your love today. Jesus, I say yes to your invitation to make me new, to make me a new creation. And to the best of my ability right now, I lay down my life and ask that you would come and fill me with yours. I turn my back on my life and I turn my face, my heart, and all of my being fully to you right now, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the second thing I want to do is I just want to invite you to come forward. If you have those little foxes, those little saviors that you're like, you know, I want to bring those to the altar. I'm just going to ask you to just come forward and just come and just begin to fill up this area here. If you're like, I just don't want to carry those around, whoever big or little or small, those little foxes that have gotten into my way of my relationship with Jesus, whatever that looks like for you. Whatever, maybe it was a distracting thing. Maybe it's something that has been grabbing the majority of your attention or those little things that are throwing you off course and just come back to that place of your one goal, your one aim is to know Jesus, to expand your relationship with him and to deepen your trust in Jesus. And as you come forward, I want you to just lay those little saviors, those little things, those little foxes, just, just give them to Jesus. Because he says, if you catch them and remove them, I will do it with you.
thank you that there is no other God but you. God, we thank you there's no other God but you. God, we just put you on the throne of our life, God. Lord, we thank you for just dismantling and destroying every mini throne, God. Every mini savior, God. Every fox, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that there is no God but you. There is no Lord but you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for a new day of freedom in you. Thank you, God, for a new day of intimacy with you, Jesus. So, Lord, we just take you up on your offer, God. We take you up on your offer to arise, to step into the season change, God. Song of Songs, verse 10, chapter 2 says, Arise, my dearest, hurry, my darling, and come away with me. I have come, as you've asked, to draw near to you and for you to draw near to my heart, and I will lead you out. For now is the time, my beautiful one. The season has changed. The bondage of your barren winter has ended. And the season of hiding is over and gone. And the rains are coming to soak the earth. And they will leave it bright with blossoming flowers. The season for singing and pruning the vines has arrived. I hear the cooing of doves in the land and filling the air with songs to awaken you and to guide you forward. Thank you, Jesus. You know, we're just not built to do the Christian life alone. So just put your hand on your neighbor right now. If you're up front, just crawl over, kneel over. If you're sitting somewhere, just go. And if you have to move a couple seats over, just put your hand on their shoulder. Put your hand on your neighbor right now. And I want you to just thank the Lord for their life. I want you to thank the Lord for their life, that they've been crafted and designed with a purpose. They've been crafted and designed in the secret place, that they've been called in to that cleft, that, that, that hidden place in God's heart. And there's no distance between God and them when they turn their affections towards them. And they carry such a revelation of God's heart to the planet. But there, there's also just an invitation on them to know Jesus, that he is calling them to know him intimately. So we thank you, Holy Spirit. We just thank you for that person, Lord. We thank you, God, right now for that person, Lord, who's divinely and uniquely made in your image. Lord, thank you you don't make robots, God. Thank you, God, you don't make robots, that you make people, God, that you're so creative in your ways. So we just release life on that person right now and just a sense of calling, God, and just those ears to hear and those eyes to see afresh in this season as you call them out. 
God, as you're beginning to grow in new places and those, those, those flowers are blossoming, God, those things are coming to the surface, we just thank you for it right now, Jesus. We just thank you for it right now, God. And we bless that person right now, Lord. We just release a blessing over them that they need a blessing from the body. So we just release that blessing over them right now, Jesus. That they're never alone, that they're never alone, that they're never alone that they are so more fully loved than they realize. And that invitation over them is there. The door is swung open. So we say, go in boldness to your champion king. We say, go in boldness to that throne room. Go in boldness in that place of intimacy again. We say, go in boldness to that place of revelation, that place of connecting to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just speak over them that 2020 is going to be a year of deepening your intimacy with Jesus. That you are now positioned to pull, push everything else aside. For everything to get out of your way. That you would only have eyes for just one thing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I just see, I just see this flame. It was like this little flame I saw of, of your prayer life, your prayer, your closet. I saw these closets with this little flame that just began to grow. So Lord, I thank you for just a fresh fire. Lord, that we're gonna encounter you in just such a fresh fire, Lord, when we go to you. God in need, when we go to you in prayer, that our secret place is a fiery place of your presence, God. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. And I see some of us who, who I see some, the Lord is going to be calling out in the morning hours where once you're like, that, that's the worst thing you can imagine. There's going to be a grace for it to wake up early and to almost arise with the dew. That it says that as the dew covers the earth, it's like your secret place time is just going to be so covered with the glory, with that presence of the Lord, that you're going to do it effortlessly. It's not going to be begrudgingly, that you're going to actually be awoken by the Lord and wake up with a grace to just begin to encounter Jesus, to begin to just mine those storehouses and dig those wells. And I just say this, that your families are going to be changed by you digging those wells with Jesus by you just digging that well of Jesus, of Savior God, that your families are going to get changed by it. So Lord, we just thank you right now, Lord, that the increase of your government, there is no end. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we bless you, God. Well, if you want to continue to soak, you can. Let's just give Jesus a, just a shout. Lord, we just love you, Jesus. You're awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Give someone, give someone a hug around you. We're going to have our ministry teams come forward. They're going to be one with name badges on. If you want a prophetic word, if you can't make it to our New Year's Eve service, but want a prophetic word, let our teams pray for you. If you need healing in your bodies, let our teams pray for you. They're going to be the ones up here. And uh, we'll see you guys in a couple nights at our New Year's Eve service. It's a come and go environment. You come in, get communion, get prayer. You can go.